Welcome to Marketgy, the science of marketing strategy, a bi-weekly podcast where all the cool marketers discuss their favorite marketing strategies, study by study. On this show, we feature marketing risk takers who believe long-term wins for the customer equal long-term wins for the business too. How? Human-led marketing. The combination of where science, creativity, and strategy meet, or as we also like to call it, Marketgy. Let's break down the marketing trends, myths, and methodologies together. I'm your host, Leanne Dow Weimer. Let's go. Hi, thanks Hi. for joining me. Thanks for having me. So today on this episode, we have Sarah Noel Block, for, who does inbound marketing for tiny teams. She helps entrepreneurs and marketers show up, add value, and build trust with content marketing and repurposing frameworks. She's also the host of Tiny Marketing Show, which is a really great podcast for people looking to add content marketing and get all sorts of ideas. Sarah, go ahead and tell us more about what, what you do in, in your background. Yeah, so I've been in marketing for 15 years, and I always like to remind people that I was doing content marketing before it had a phrase, like before it was called content marketing. I called it education-based marketing, but I've always found it important to, for marketers to, to be a teacher and to teach their customers how to solve their problems. So that's how I approach marketing. I've had, I founded Tiny Marketing two years ago, um, full time, but I was doing it on the side for about 10 years. And there I work with, you just said it, entrepreneurs and small businesses to help them build out content engines and repurposing frameworks. And then I work directly with a lot of companies to doing the actual content production. And then, yeah, I have the Tiny Marketing Show podcast and YouTube where I talk all about that, how to build effective and efficient marketing for tiny teams. Awesome. And I think it's so cool that you were doing this before it was cool. I, I know that that <laughs> is, I mean, I, I relate to that so strongly. You know, I, I think in like 2010, I was trying to get backlinks and people weren't like, yeah, this is SEO. This is social media marketing. I was like, no, I need to be like on Twitter. And, <laughs> um, you know, what a wild ride that's been. Uh, so right? I, I think like the OGs in marketing <laughs> understand good marketing, yeah. like regardless of channels. I remember when Facebook first launched and it was just colleges and I was in my first marketing job when they opened it up to businesses. And I was like, oh my God, let's get on this. <laughs> new thing, new thing. We've got to be here. <laughs> you know, I love a shiny object. Let me see it. <laughs> Especially when it still has reach. <laughs> yes. It was all organic then. They didn't even have a paid option. I know. Like, that's that's so crazy that you were on Facebook before it had paid options. <laughs> yeah, you needed a dot .edu. <laughs> Oh man. So, so when you have been doing this for so long, what are some of the strategies that you really have found to be like the most impactful to someone starting their, their kind of content engine or, or like, how do you, how do you help them at the beginning to, to wrap their mind around what you're trying to tell them? Yeah. So at the beginning, you don't just jump in. You need to understand your customer first and build out that foundation. And you can do that with testing, like LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, whatever. Those are all great platforms to do some testing. So come up with your content pillars, what your customer has a problem with and what you solve. Where that meets in the middle, that's where your content pillars live and test out that type of content on those platforms. What gets the most engagement? And that should be what you build out to create that content engine that'll turn into something bigger. Awesome. So, you know, kind of see see if what you think it is really is what resonates with them. And yeah. then when you're a tiny guy and you don't have time or the resources to actually survey your customers or you don't even have customers yet mm -hmm. that's the best way to go about it is just go to the masses and see who engages with it and they'll they'll raise their hand they'll tell you what's working what's not yeah and and it can be hard because at first you'll hear a lot of crickets <laughs> yeah 
<laughs> oh my gosh, the crickets. You feel like you're screaming into a void, but eventually people notice you exist. Definitely. And and to that end, I've um what's your take on I've heard people say like, "Oh, my account's not big enough to do that kind of testing." Like what how do you feel about that? Like how do you reframe that? Like your your platform, your social media followers? Yeah, they're like, "Well, you know, I I don't know how much impact this is going to be or or you know, I can't like for example, here's a concrete example. Like Instagram stories you can do these like surveys, like these polls. Mm -hmm. And I think they're great for market research. I love them. I, yeah. I have so much fun with like, with them. Um, and I've heard people say like, oh, well you can't, my account's not big enough to ask these type of questions. Well, it can be. <laughs> um, you gotta start somewhere. So you might as well just start talking. You might not have a big enough audience to start getting a lot of poll results, but I at least know on LinkedIn, polls are boosted more than everyone else, than like text-based or video-based content. So your polls will get seen by people, even if they're not followers of yours. And I mean, I started at zero. We all started at zero. You got to just get started and people will find you as long as you're talking about things that they care about. Definitely. So following like what people care about and, and trying to like get started on that. What are some ways that, um, the, that people can do that? Um, find out what people care about. Yeah. I would say the easiest, if we're talking to people who have no audience right now, my go-to first thing is going to publications, media kits, like, let's say you want to talk to small businesses and that's who you want. Um, if you go to like small biz trends, their media kit and download it, there's a ton of information in there that will help you understand your audience a little bit better. Same goes for all of those major publications. They have done tons of research on their audience, find publications that align with your audience and they'll have the data. So that's a good place to start. And these publications already have content pillars. So you can steal them for your testing. Use their content pillars and see what works for your audience. That's when the testing takes place. For sure. And so, okay, let's say someone's moved on a little bit and now they're ready to do a con. What is a content pillar? Let's, let's explain the concept of a content pillar. Yeah. So a content pillar would be like the overarching things that you're going to talk about. So categories, I would say, you don't want to go too broad because then you're known for nothing. You need to have like four is a really good number. I like four content pillars and it would be broader topics like email marketing, social media, <laughs> um, project, probably like more like marketing operations, things like that. And then you can pick different topics within those pillars but they are, they're broad topics that you want to stay within. So you become known for something. Yeah. And, and I think that that's a really great way to explain it. Sometimes in my head, I, I get very visual and I imagine like an ancient Greece, like pantheon kind of situation where you have the, the columns and the pillars and they're holding up everything. That's a good um, way to put it. That's, that's where my mind goes. Very visual. Yeah, very you're holding up your marketing. I get that. Your pillars are, you pull them through to all of your marketing. So that, I like that. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're going to be a little goofy about it, right? <laughs> so um, with these pillars, one of the things that you recommend for like strategically is to not um, overwhelm yourself with too many too many choices mm -hmm. is kind of what I'm hearing. It, it sticks it's, about four. Yeah, it's more about overwhelming your audience. So they are like, I don't know what you're an expert at because you're talking about too many things. <laughs> so you don't want to overwhelm them. Yeah, it'll dilute your message, really. Completely. So with these pillars, then what? Then what? So the pillars pull through to all of your other marketing. You want to keep it consistent with your content marketing. So these pillars will be what you talk about on social media, in your email newsletters, 
blogs, podcasts, uh, YouTube videos, whatever it may be, keep it to that. And you want your pillars to highlight your services, obviously, the things that you'd be willing to sell. And think about it like a dent of Venn diagram, what you sell, what your audience needs help with, what's in the middle is those content pillars, and it needs to align with your products or services. And that's what you talk about everywhere. Exactly. I love it. Um, so when you have these pillars, you know, kind of one way I think of pillar content is some like big project that then I can distribute on many channels. Is that a pretty fair way to think of it? I see where you're coming from, like a pillar page. Yeah, and or like a video or a webinar or... Yeah, that's not what I'm talking about. But I do understand what you're talking about. So when I say pillar, it's more along the content strategy um, range. So it's more in the foundation of what you'd be talking about. But those big pillar pages and videos, those would be taken from your pillars. These are the topics that I can talk about. And then you definitely want to repurpose them and make sure they're everywhere. If you're, what you're talking about, I always refer to it as core content. This is a core piece of content. It's a big chunky one. And I can knock it around and create a <laughs> bunch of little content babies for email and social and video and whatnot. Yeah. So, so that's a really great way to, to explain the misconception between pillar strategy and pillar tactics. Yeah. Two different things, but I do understand what you're saying. <laughs> two different things. But if we drew a Venn diagram, they do meet in the right. middle. <laughs> yes. They're aligned. <laughs> <laughs> There's synergies there. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, I just think synergies is a funny word um, <laughs> because it's so overused jargon-wise. Oh, very much so. Uh, <laughs> Love my synergies. <laughs> yeah. It's synergy season. Mm -hmm. um, Feels you know. synergy outside right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so strategically – there is the the pillars and then you know when someone doesn't have an audience they can kind of test and play around and see what those are going to be mm -hmm. um how much do you think the pillars should reflect internally like what's happening within the organization or the entrepreneur versus what their target market needs or wants by internally do you mean like what products or services they're working on right now um, not just that, but like their overall like culture or vibe or preferences or, you know, yeah. that personality. I, yeah, I think all of that falls, it doesn't really fall into the pillars category, but it falls within the voice, your right. brand voice. So all of that should be part of what you're using to create your content because you don't want to sound like everybody else. I, I have this webinar that I do sometimes that's a content differentiator, and it's basically defining your voice, what makes you different, and how you can stand out from everyone else who's talking about the same old stuff. Absolutely. And and so I know it sound, it's starting to sound with all my questions like I don't know anything about marketing, but guys, bear with me. I'm asking things that are common misconceptions about what Sarah's talking about. <laughs> There's also the fact that like people use different different phrases for all of these things. There's not like a set, this is what you call it. So yeah, for sure. There's, there's very few set defined things. Yeah. Um, you know, I, because we could even go so far as to call this a demand generation strategy. You could, we could there's call it inbound. So yes. And like some people would consider social media, not part of content marketing, but I think it falls under the content marketing umbrella. Uh, I, I would go content. It's a hill I will die on. Social marketing <laughs> is a part of content marketing. Mm -hmm. you, it, it, there's just no way it's not. Um, Same with email. It, 100. Yeah, because it, it it's literally a piece of content. Like it's. Yeah. How can it not be? Are, is there no words or pictures or videos? <laughs> is there no <laughs> subject line? All right. We're reinventing email marketing. It is now a fact. Page, fine. <laughs> you win this one. <laughs> Um, so now 
what are some things that people commonly do? Like, think about the best way that you've seen someone execute this pillar strategy. What are some of the characteristics that you've seen there? I would say saying the same thing in very different ways. <laughs> so I went to content marketing world. It was in September and I, 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 I love the pillar strategy. So I sat in this little, I sat in a pillar strategy session and I was like, okay, this is brilliant. So what they do is they create a giant pillar page and this is referring to pillar content, not pillar <laughs> strategy. <laughs> um, they create a giant pillar page and then they break it down into a whole bunch of different blogs and different social media posts and email. It's just a matter of repurposing everything that you create, but having that pillar page that is linked back to and referred to in all of those, it's enormous juice for SEO. It's great for that, but it's also really helpful and valuable for your audience as they're trying to learn this thing. They have a lot of different resources to choose from. And everybody, I said earlier, I think marketers are teachers. Everybody has a different learning style. So by creating content that's video, podcast, blog, you're giving them the education in the format that they need, the way they learn. Yeah, 100%. Because, you know, maybe somebody doesn't have time to read the whole article, but they can listen to a podcast on their commute yeah. or vice versa. Yeah. And take away any friction with those long pillar pages and put a table of contents that's linkable to get them to the different sections. Make it easy for them to use your content. Absolutely. Um, and then, I mean, the, the the data analyst kind of side of me is like, and then you can mark, you know, like your, you know, your KPIs against who clicked what and, you know, what your results yeah. were, you know, where, heat map it. Like, let's see where it got the most interaction and, and attention. Yeah, but if you brilliant. If you don't... Um, if you don't put it out there and you don't start it as a pillar and you don't refer back to it, you'll never know. No, no one's seeing it. You can't create content in a vacuum and not have a repurposing and distribution strategy to go with it. It's just going to sit there. And for smaller organizations, so let's say you're not like a big behemoth, like let's say you don't have $400 million of marketing budget a year, <laughs> right? What it like... Do you feel like this is especially impactful for them and like how so? Yeah, I mean, I don't have 400 million <laughs> marketing dollars and this is what I did to build my business. It's all organic. It's all through content marketing. And those are the companies that I work with too. They're all somewhere between like 1 million and $30 million companies in revenue. So 30 million sounds big, but usually they don't even have a marketing department yet. That's the size they're at. And they don't have a big marketing budget at all. It's just for outsourcing. It has a massive impact because you can get, you're showing up everywhere. You're showing up in all of those platforms. You're building trust and value for your audience, wherever they might be. So it's very impactful to do it that way. And definitely add PR as part of your content strategy too. I love it. I love, I love PR for this. Um, I think that as far as um, SEO and just kind of backlinks and credibility, that just having that press release, even, even if you're just going to, you know, table stakes, like start at the, the very basics, just having a press release. Yeah. For backlinks, it's amazing. Even if like nobody good picks it up, it gets picked up by, I don't know, like 250 just by distributing it. And those are some solid backlinks. But for like when I first started my business, actually before I started my business, I'm doing an in-person speaking thing tonight with American Marketing Association. And this is the topic I'm talking about. So it's fresh on my mind. I was working on the deck earlier. And I had built up my personal brand and my entire year worth of contracts to make up my salary before I ever left my job. And I did that part with PR first, doing guest posts in other publications, things like this, being a guest on podcasts and webinars and YouTube videos. 
And that is where my first like 12 clients came from was that. Yeah. And, and I want to point out something that, that stands out to me, right? Because I, I agree with this fully, right? You have to PR your own career um, mm -hmm. because nobody knows what you know unless you tell them you know it. Yeah. So just like our, our clients can exist in a vacuum, you know, their content, if, if you don't distribute it, if you don't put their name out there, if they don't do any sort of content or other marketing, no one will know about them. Same with us as people and professionals. Yeah. And you could think of PR too as a distribution tactic for your own content, which is you. Everything you say is your own content. <laughs> and you have an opportunity to share your content on all of those different publications or podcasts that you might be on. And you're getting in front of a new audience that could potentially buy from you. Even now, two years later, 50% of my, of my clients find me through PR stuff like this. That's so cool. That's the, so anyone listening, if you are worried about getting started, like, you know, it sounds like Sarah's really used herself as proof of concept for some of her, you know, yeah, I'm no a test subject always <laughs> test subject. And I think that's the sign of a good marketer, right? Is, is that we believe so strongly and passionately about our ideas that we're willing to use ourselves as guinea pigs. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I, I've always been the test person. Let's see if this works. Oh, that was a failure. <laughs> All right. So I'm not going to be doing that with anybody. Um, <laughs> uh, now with kind of coming back to, to failures and, um, and pillar content, who is this wrong for? Like, who wouldn't this fit right with? Pillar content itself, I can't imagine that it wouldn't fit with anyone. You need to be able to have, it's, it's about your niche. Mm -hmm. No matter your size, you need to have that niche and you need to have what matters to your audience front and center. So you need those pillar strategies. Now, content marketing in itself I would say it's not right to start at the very beginning with that. Um, as I was just saying, I started with all PR and then I moved into content marketing and that worked really well for me. So now my business is still 100% organic, all the sales that come in, but it's 50% from content marketing, 50% from PR. Yeah. So I, I would say that you need to have just enough to have credibility um, as far as content goes, if we're going to be very generous with our definition of content. Yeah. Like if on social media, you definitely want to start that from the very beginning. Yeah, definitely. And, and, you know, a website or a landing page of some yes, sort. You definitely want a website, <laughs> but like, you don't need to launch a podcast. You don't need to launch a YouTube channel or a blog right at the very beginning. Um, you want to build up that audience first. So you have people to distribute it to. Yeah. I mean, it, I see, I see the opposite too, right? Let's hear it. Because if you're trying to, the heart, this is where it depends, right? That's, that's the, the marketer's favorite phrase. It depends. It is my um, favorite. How'd you know? <laughs> <laughs> if you go all in on creating a community by jumping into like, podcasting or it, it all depends on what your outbound connection relationship building looks like. Yeah, that's, that's true. If you're able to build an audience, if you have that skill set to build the audience while you're creating those channels, because that gives you something to talk about and distribute, that's a different case. I agree with you there. But it's hard, right? You, that... But first, it doesn't matter which method or strategy you choose, you have to be talking at someone instead of everyone. Yeah, exactly. That's why I'm like, mm, content pillar in the strategy sense, definitely it should be for everybody, even a single personal brand. Definitely. Um, so now when we look at what's happened um, kind of this winter as far as the changes in algorithms and ownership of platforms of, you know, all these many things that are just kind of a, 
part of playing the game as far as like social media or content building. Um, where do you think the future of marketing is going? Yeah, I mean, it it needs to move more towards personalization. And with what you were saying before, with social media, with the algorithms changing and all of that, yeah, you don't own those people. I might have a great audience on LinkedIn or Twitter or whatever, but if Elon Musk just bought Twitter, if that was my main platform and he decides to turn it upside down, I'm screwed. So you want to be able to have those, like move that relationship internal. So you have those email addresses and then you can move them through into other pieces of content and have more of a relationship. But then as far as personalization is concerned, like I like using tools like Bonjoro where you could do like one-to-one -one videos with people who subscribe. It's just quick 10 seconds of your time, but it feels really personal and you build more of a connection with that person. Definitely. Um, fun fact, in a future episode, Casey Hill of Bonjoro will be joining us. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I definitely think that there's, I think that there's a lot of value there worth investigating. Um, you're absolutely right. Where now, where you think it is going and where you think it should go, do you see any any kind of split in the path there? Where I think it should go and where it is going. Yeah, I mean, I think that it is going more towards mass and automation where there is less personalization, but it really depends on the marketer taking hold of that because you can still create that personalized relationship with someone, even at mass. You just have to do it very strategically. So hopefully that's a priority. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and and I think kind of relating that back to the pillar content and, you know, the customer is that you have to understand your people. Yeah, yeah, you really do. You need to know where they're hanging out online, what they care about. Otherwise, well, you're not going to have an audience. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so if you were going to give someone like two or three tips when they're thinking of everything that we've talked about today, what, what would you like them to kind of really take to heart? Yeah, I would start with interviewing your customers and making that part of your process. So you understand what their pain points are, why they chose to work with you instead of someone else, what it is that stood out about you and the experience of working with you understand this information because that'll make it a lot easier to create that content later and to understand how to sell later. So have those conversations with your customers and you can have personal conversations first off, but once a year, I would also send out a survey so you can at mass get that information too. Absolutely. Yeah. And then um, my third would be to have conversations, real conversations on social media. It's some of my closest business friends I met through LinkedIn and it wouldn't happen if I didn't, you know, respond, reply back to people in, in the comments or engage with their content. So those conversations really make a huge difference. Yeah, absolutely. We met through LinkedIn, right? Yeah. We did. <laughs> and I'm so grateful for that. Um, you know, I think you just have such a wealth of knowledge and experience. And Thanks. thank you for sharing it with us. Um, if someone wanted to find out more about what you're up to or listen to your podcast, how could they get in touch or, you know, stay connected with you? Yeah. So all of the social medias and my website, it's just my name, Sarah Noel Block. Easy. And then my podcast and YouTube show are Tiny Marketing. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining me. And, um, you know, once again, Sarah Noel Block, bringing us the facts about pillar marketing, what it is and what it isn't. And, uh, you know, thank you so much for joining. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to Marketgy, the science of marketing strategy. 
If any of the strategies we talked about today inspired you to learn more, try them. Remember, the perfect strategy doesn't exist, only the one that gets done. Subscribe to our show on your favorite podcast player to make sure that you never miss an episode. Thanks for listening. Until next time.